And I think we've all had that situation of you think it's going badly. And then at the end, the lady with the stoic face gives you a 20 and told you it was the best tour she ever had. Just like an improv scene, if it feels awkward or strange, double down, recommit, keep going, make more eye contact, sink further, go deeper, don't pull away. Welcome to the Torpreneur Podcast. Travel industry veteran Shane Whaley will take you on a journey with fellow Torpreneurs, sharing their tips, ideas, insights, and success stories to inspire you to make your tour business the best it can be. And now, please welcome your host, Shane. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 12 of the Torpreneur Podcast. Really appreciate you tuning in to today's show. Now, one of the top questions I get here at the Tourpreneur Studios, other than how can I be number one in Google for my tour or my activity, is uh, I need help hiring, uh, training, interviewing tour guides. So I have invited Margaret Hicks onto today's show. Now, Margaret runs a business called The Tour Boost, and she offers workshops for training tour guides, docents, and storytellers. Um, in a little bit of a different way, maybe a bit quirky, she uses hand-picked improv games She provides on-your-feet training, connecting guides to their emotions, boosting presentation skills, and finding fun in their tours. And she gives us tips. This isn't a sales pitch, okay? She actually gives us some tips that you can implement in your business with your tour guides today. Margaret is very experienced in the world of tours. So she runs her own tour business up there in Chicago. I'm excited to go on one of her tours very shortly. Uh, She's been doing that for over six years. Before that, she was a comedian. I almost asked her to tell her a couple of jokes, but I figured, yeah, uh, busman's holiday, that, right? So she was a comedian before, and she's been involved in improv for 15 years. She's also an avid traveler and has traveled all over the world. And she quite rightly says that she knows about tour guiding from experience, that she's been on the streets, the bus, the boat, the museum. She knows the struggles, and she says she knows a way to help in a very affable, friendly, and fun way. Um, she realizes the idea of improv can be scary, scary, bloody terrifying. I've never done it. People have told me I should. They said, you do a podcast, you should do improv. (laughs) Uh, But she says she has a gentle touch. Uh, So really excited to bring you Margaret today on the show. She's also speaking at Arrival Orlando. So yet another reason, what's that reason? 2,326 to go to Orlando Arrival. Uh, She's giving a presentation there as well. Before we hand over to Margaret, I just want to say, if you run a business, where you're training on different aspects of running a tour business, drop me a line. I'm always looking to share your knowledge and your experience with people. As long as you don't treat it as a sales pitch, but you're going to come on and give us some value, uh, I'm very happy to share your expertise. So let's cross over to Chicago, to Margaret Hicks of thetourboost.com. Never miss an episode of the show. Subscribe at tourpreneur.com forward slash subscribe. Margaret Hicks, welcome to Tourpreneur, episode 12. How are you? I'm really well, Shane. Thanks for asking. Thank you. I'm really excited to learn more about you. And we decided that for this episode, we're actually going to feature the Tour Boost business that you run because you also run a tour business. And I'm really excited to come on one of your tours in Chicago very soon. And I'll report back on that. And today I wanted to really find out more about the Tour Boost, particularly because one of the top questions that I get here at Tourpreneur is, hey, you know, I know how to run a business, I know how to do marketing, but I'm really struggling on training my tour guides. And obviously, this is something that you're, you're helping companies with. What led to you starting the Tour Boost? When I started my own tour business in 2010, when I started Chicago Elevated, I'd been a volunteer tour guide for a couple of years, but primarily what I did before that is I was an improviser, an improv comedian here in Chicago. And when I started Chicago Elevated, it was probably the first thing in my life that I was extremely good at. And it surprised me. It really, I found tour guiding late in my life, like a lot of us do. And it surprised me that I found something I was this good at. And when I stopped to really ask why I was good at this, it was extremely clear that it was my improv training that helped me set it over the edge, right? Help make things just a little bit better. And uh, once I realized that, it really was just two and two, put four together and try to teach it to other people. It just became the most important thing 
And um, the great thing about improv is that it is easily teachable. Right. And how did your background in comedy and improv, you know, what did you learn from that world to bring into the tour world in particular? Sure. I mean, the great thing about improv is it's really life skills. People get thrown off by the comedy part of it. But improvisation was really born out of like play therapy. So the skills particularly that I learned were active listening Actually, really, I mean, in improv, we are truly taught to listen deeply and support each other. And that is such a skill, especially for a tour guide, when it feels like you're the one talking all the time to think about how strong your listening skills are. It just seems almost anti-intuitive. And then the other thing is storytelling and not just storytelling. Certainly in improv, we learn how to create stories and, you know, critical moments and all that kind of thing, but more also how to attach some emotion to the story and then how to incorporate your body (laughs) and your face and your legs and your arms. Uh, We have a, a great improv teacher from the past who said, listen with your elbow, right? Feel it with your stomach, hear with your eyes, right? That your whole body is involved in all of this. And so I would say mainly those learning how to listen to each other and learning not only how to craft a story, but be emotional with it and be physical with it. Wow. I I hear this a great deal. In fact, my previous job, I worked for Get Your Guide and at the head office there in Berlin, quite a few of my colleagues, they had an in-house improv that they would do every Tuesday night. And it was really cool to see maybe some of the more withdrawn or introverted members of staff uh, going to improv and actually seeing how they change. There was one guy in particular, and I won't name him because I know he listens to the show, but I was always <laughs> amazed how he, his public speaking got much better. He got more engaging. He got to the point quicker. He really, and he had to listen in his job and he'd had some problems in the past where maybe he wasn't. And just the improv, you know, I've seen it firsthand of just working for a corporate that really helps. So I can imagine for a tour guide because, it, you know, there is very little tour guide training out there, isn't there? I mean, a lot of people are just thrown in at the deep end. We're completely on our own. We are completely on our own. And that's one thing I think we like about the work. I mean, I definitely think tour guides are not so great with authority a lot of times. And we like to make our own choices and choose our own facts and choose our own roots. And we put it together and we put it together in our head and we seem to be afraid of telling each other about it. And so tour guide training, I think, is really hard. And when everyone has different content then that is also difficult because if you're working past something that is just content, then it can also get difficult. But that's what's so great about improv. Your content does not matter to me at all. I am not coming in to fix that or work with that in any way. In fact, I'd rather you forget it (laughs) when we go into our workshop, forget all your facts, let them go. So I, this is a nice way. Like you said, one of the things I love about the workshop is watching each other and watching yeah. other people come out of their shell. And it, the great thing about improv is there's all these side benefits, right? So the workshop is about storytelling. And then the side benefits are the team building. I mean, watching other people. And then as tour guides, we learn so much from watching each other. So then watching each other break through, uh, it's much easier for you to do it then. And what do you think are some of the most common challenges that tourpreneurs face when it comes to training tour guides? So when you're out, you know, you've been commissioned to come in and run some training, what are tourpreneurs saying to you that they need fixing? What are they concerned about? This whole thing about um, making everything an experience, right? Everything's got to be this, feel the moment, remember the moment and the experience. And that's such a hard thing to grab onto. What is that? How do you create that? How do you make that happen? And words like authenticity, right, that just have all this meaning to them now. And so I think for people training other guides, number one, how to attack those soft skills that you know are pushing tours over the edge in a positive way. And then I think also how to keep everyone's personality. You can't make everyone the same. If you've got one great guide, you're not going to try and make everybody like that guide. That's never going to work. So I think practicing the soft skills and how to practice them, we all know what they are. How do you practice it? And then how do you bring out each person in their personality and not try to make them all the same? 
Yeah, you don't cookie cut as every tour guide, right? Exactly. You really want to bring out what they're good at and their personality. And I'm really loud and outgoing and a little manic. I love tour guides that aren't like me. That's the best, right? So how do you bring out more of that, more of who they are? And that, that's authenticity, right? Letting your guides be who they actually are. That's authentic. In my experience, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but the majority of good tour guides I've met, they just have a burning passion for what they're guiding on. So what the subject may be, the topic, the area, et cetera. But then that doesn't necessarily mean that just because somebody has the passion, like, you know, I have a passion for the German language. I'd be an awful <laughs> teacher at it. Right. Just because I'm passionate about speaking it doesn't mean I'd be great at it. So I think, you know, you, you can take that, yeah, this person's got the passion. They might have a degree in local history or whatever it may be. But then it's like, how do they articulate that in a way that, you know, is applicable to everybody for each education level, for instance, I think is really important. Completely. And this whole thing of walking this fine line of being an educator and an entertainer, that's a hard line to walk. And I think even when you're talking about, you know, the most deepest, most important piece of art, you're still entertaining. And so it's, it's also how to get that. I call tour guides theater people without the theater background, right? We are showmen, even if we're quiet or intellectual or a little more introverted, we can still find where that passion is and then give it a little bit of order and a little bit of structure. Yeah. You mentioned active listening as a key skill. Why do you think that is when so much of tour guiding is explaining and, and pointing out and narrating, et cetera? Oh my gosh. It's just when I think when I figured this out, that was really what pushed me over the edge. The thing about active listening is it's just kindness, I think. And when the tour guide is up and speaking, and a very simple example is when someone has a question, right? And then maybe they interrupt you to ask this question and you're annoyed because they threw you off and maybe it's, maybe it's not the greatest question and the rest of the group doesn't want to know and you were building right up to this moment. What we learn in improv is a, a little trick called yes and, where we accept the response and then add to it. So yes and helps me a lot, right? When somebody asks a question, my first response, yeah, great question. And here's the answer. And it's such a quick way to help them feel included. And you don't know what the rest of the group wants to know. And so you might as well answer the question. And if you do it with respect and kindness, who knows what's going to come out of that then? Also, questions like that and interruptions like that tend to be what make the tour original and different from the one you gave yesterday. Yeah. So to accept these breaks in your flow, it's so important to accept them with a yes and add to them and make the person feel great for asking the question. Little things like that. And um, in improv, we talk a lot about how the audience is half of our content. Yes. The audience helps decide what we talk about. And as a tour guide, that seems really strange. But we all know if you tell a story and the crowd's not responding, you're probably not going to tell that story again next time. You might take it out, add something else, right? So we're constantly changing what we're doing depending on, on what the audience says and hears. So we might as well listen to what they're saying. So on that then, let's say you're telling a story, let's say I'm on your tour in Chicago and you're just not getting anything from the tour group, right? What <laughs> techniques, what tactics have you got? Because, you know, the thing is, if you think about going on a tour, you know, you turn up, you don't know anybody else. Nobody really wants to look stupid, right? Most of the time. There's a few out there that don't care. But, you know, what tactics do you have for drawing questions out from the group? Sure. And, it, you know, there's nothing wrong with a quiet group. Mm -hmm. Quiet groups are great. I love them. It means that a lot of times it means they're thinking about it and taking it all in. So there's um, a trope that we use in improv, um, be in the scene you're in, not in the scene you want to be in. And so this is just another mode of yes and, right? It's just accepting the situation that you're in. So if you're in a tour and everybody's really quiet, nobody seems like they're enjoying it. Uh, this is the tour that you're in, yeah. right? This is the tour that you're leading right now. So you have to work with it. I, I teach how to read body language from your group, but I think a lot of times we're not so good at it. And it's just like your tour guide. Even if you have a quiet tour guide, that doesn't mean that they're not working it. And just because you have a quiet group doesn't mean they're not working it. 
My biggest thing that I will do in that situation is number one, just keep going, right? You're in the scene, keep being in the scene that you're in. And you never know if there's one woman back there, her face is stoic, but she's having the best time. And I think we've all had that situation of you think it's going badly. And then at the end, the lady with the stoic face gives you a 20 and told you it was the best tour she ever had. Just like an improv scene, if it feels awkward or strange, double down, recommit, keep going, make more eye contact, sink further, go deeper, don't pull away. Uh, the trick for me is um, not getting manic. Right. Right. I tend to like get a lot of energy. My hands start going and I start overcompensating. And that's where just a little bit of mindfulness comes in. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, when you start one of your tours, for instance, you know, would you advise or not advise tour guys to start off with like, Hey, you know, thanks for signing up for the tour. What are you looking to learn today? What are you looking to see today? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I tend to not ask that question on my tours. I think it's a perfectly great question to ask, right? If that's what kind of tour guide you are, I think that that is really valid. And getting feedback from them in whatever way, and then you've got to take that. That's the trick with that question. You've got to take that feedback, hear it, and spit <laughs> it back, right? You've got to give it back. Yeah, my worry would be they would say, oh, we want to see A, B, and C. And you're like, well, this tour is D, E, and F. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So we're not going to see any of those things you want yeah. to see today. And then even in a situation like that, though, it's so easy to turn that right back around. How would you do that? I would laugh. You know, first thing, like, hey, I would completely admit what was happening right there. Yeah. Let the mistake be real because... When you laugh with them and be like, well, we're not seeing any of that today. And you yeah. giggle and you tell them the truth and they're going to laugh too. And then all of a sudden you have a nice original tour that is completely different than anything else they've been on. And in full disclosure, I have never led a tour. So I'm thinking purely I've been in sales for over 20 years. That's one of the things you do when you're selling is you ask that discovery question. Ah, hey, yeah, you know, what do you, what do you, so I've always wondered if to how that would translate to actually running tours. Certainly, so, uh, we would get that out. If it was like a private tour or something like yeah. that, I would get that out of the way before we even started. Yeah, absolutely. So let's say, for instance, recently I was on a Cold War tour of Berlin because it's one of my things I'm interested in. And the guide, and I won't say the company, you know, basically gave some pretty bad, false, inaccurate oh. information. Don't think it was intended, but it was oh. either what he or she had been told to say or they just hadn't done their homework. Yeah. At what point do you think that or do you totally disagree that fake it till you make it? It's better to say, hey, I don't know. I can find out for you. Or what's your approach to that? There is no doubt in my mind that if you don't know something, you say it out yeah. loud right away and look it up together. That is always the best thing. Sometimes someone in the group will know it. And that's when you also have to yes and. Yeah. So you don't feel like your status is lowered. But if someone in the group knows the answer and then you all find it together. Wow. I mean, that makes that person and the group feel really good. And um, if you search the answer together, that's even better. And I have definitely been known to send out an email after a tour once I found the answer later. I have no trouble with that. No one expects us to be perfect. Nobody, nobody, nobody. And I find that when you admit what you don't know, it makes you more personable. It makes it more real, all those things. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind that I'll absolutely admit what I don't know when I don't know it. I think that's sound advice. And actually, I'm reading a book right now called Think Like a Freak, which is by the Freakonomic audience. Oh, uh, great. Authors, yeah, sure. And it was like our previous guest, Diego from Fits and Farwell Bike Tours in Canada, who recommended it. And there's a chapter in there, and I did smile. I was actually listening to it on Audible yesterday as I was out, and uh, it said the three hardest words in the English language is I don't know. Yeah. I was like, yeah, that's true. Isn't that <laughs> something? Wow. I guess maybe that's improv training again. I mean, literally, we don't, you know, when you're getting up to do an improv scene, you don't know anything. You have succeeded all control. It's all gone, and you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. So saying, I don't know, maybe that's just been in my training for so long to be okay with not knowing. But absolutely. Oh my gosh. No, I'm not a fake it till you make a person. Good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> what kind of companies recruit you to work with them? Sure. Lately, mostly a lot of museums, a lot of museum docents, which is great because 
you see ghosts are just like tour guides in the way that they have found their own facts and they know their own facts. I think what happens a lot of times with museum docents, like guides, we're just telling the same stories over and over. So we tend to lose some of the passion behind the story. So it's a, it's a reigniting. Um, I've worked with some tour guide associations. The best one there is I was in Nepal and I worked with the Nepal Tour Guide Association. And um, I knew this from other people, but I didn't know it till I went to Nepal that it's also language independent. I mean, the, the Nepalese tour guide spoke great English, but you know, improv can rise above culture and language and all those things. So we had just as great of a workshop as I did with the docents at the Art Institute of Chicago. So that's kind of a fun part. And tour guide associations at this point, museums are kind of my main. Yeah. I've done a couple conferences and that kind of thing as well. But at this point, groups of tour guides. I did one for the Vegas Tour Guide Association. Oh, we had so much fun. That must have been so fun. So much fun. Yeah. Great time. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, what were some of the fun things that happened on that, that you can talk about on a, uh, <laughs> on a family-friendly show. Oh, sure. Definitely in Vegas. The, the best thing about it, the woman who is the president of that association, her name is Babs. <laughs> right. Right. Because of course it is. Yeah. And, and Babs is extraordinary. And she got us where we did the workshop was one of the higher floors at the stratosphere. Oh, yeah. So we were way high up there and we're improvising. We're going and we were right near where they do the bungee jumping. Off. Yes. So we kept seeing people like flying by the window like this every couple of minutes. It was just a joy. And then I think the best thing that comes out of that, again, is all the tour guides watching each other break free. Right. Yeah. Like it's just so much clapping and silliness in that situation. So that was just really fun. It was just a really crazy place to be. And in terms of the tour booth, so are you prepared to travel all over the U.S.? Let's say there's a company in uh, you know, Miami that are looking for this kind of training. Is that something you offer where you, you'll fly out and, and visit? Oh, sure. Outside? I'm headed to Abingdon, Virginia in a couple of weeks. And they actually got a bunch of their, it's a very touristy town. And so what they did was to get a bunch of the different attractions all together. So yeah. I think that's a great idea. So they got some people from the hotel, some people from the really popular restaurant, some people from the arts organizations, and they all pooled together. So I'm going to do nice. one big workshop for all of them. So I definitely am flying around to different places and taking buses and trains everywhere. For sure, out of town, that is the goal and eventually international. Sure. And I mean, what I love about what you're doing is it's specific training. It's not, you know, I see a lot of these people online offering complete training packages online. And I think, you know, tour guiding, in-person training, and you're, you know, you're specializing on body language, telling the story through the body, active listening. These are really hard skills, uh, especially active listening. I mean, you know. They are really hard skills. And then what's so fun about improv is you're physicalizing them. This is not a presentation. I am not yeah. standing up in the front of the room and talking to you about this. We are on our feet playing games that teach you how to listen. It's like any kind of practice. It's like a meditation practice, it's like anything. So when you're up there actively listening, how does it feel to be actively listening? Is it uncomfortable for you? Is it hard for you? Where are you clinging? Where are you holding on? So that the next time when you go out on a tour, physically, you know what it feels like to listen. And so it makes it easier. It's um, you're internalizing the lessons. So they're easier to learn. I mean, teaching someone how to listen sounds impossible. It's teaching someone how to tell a story through their face. But in the workshop, we practice. You practice. Yeah. You practice over and over and over. So by the time you go out on the street, you already know what's up. You got it. Want to connect with other tourpreneurs? Then join our Facebook group at tourpreneur.com forward slash Facebook. I mean, I had that drummed into me in my sales career that, you know, you should be spending most of your time listening. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about hosting a podcast where it's crucial to have active listening <laughs> 
is I get the files at the end of every show. I have to edit. And if I can see too much, you know, waveforms on my track, it's like, I think you might have spoken too much. It's a physical, and I don't know if it's something that you can implement in your trainings, but it's really fun. When I see that all the waveforms are on the guests, I'm like, yeah, good job. Isn't that something? I love that. That's such a neat, I wonder if there's a way to like translate that into a game, but it's, it's exactly the same thing. And I bet Shane, as you go along and you do it more and more, you get better and you can sense it before you even look at the graph. Yeah, absolutely. So could you share, say, three tips with us that entrepreneurs who are out there today can implement in their business when it comes to training tour guides? Yes, I definitely think yes and is by far the quickest and easiest way to make things easier on everybody. There are lots of yes and games. You can always find them online. But the games are just essentially someone says something and the next person says yes and and adds another thing and the first person says yes and and they keep on going. So yes and is just a really quick, fast way to make sure that you are in a grateful and gracious place and actually listening. So you're saying yes and then you're going to and your you're point. adding something, right? right? So let's say in a scene, I said, uh, mom's running late, it's raining. And then you say yes and dad's running late too. And I say yes and we have all these people coming over for a party and you say yes And they're the most important people in the city. Yes, and, right? So we're raising the stakes of Mm -hmm. the situation and listening to each other and building together, right? It's not just one person leading a scene. You are completely collaborative and building something together while you're listening to each other. So it's, it's real nice, yeah. And that's designed to create engagement between the group and the tour guide? Collaboration, listening skills, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And help them bring them out of their shell. Yeah. And again, it just gets you used to saying, yes, we say no to each other all the time. It's so True. easy. Someone the other day asked me if I wanted a cupcake. I did. And I said, no, just it's the weirdest thing. And it was like, so <laughs> even just getting used to saying yes to each other is a major move forward and a major click in your head. Yeah. What we look for in each other is warmth and competence. These are the two things we notice in each other right away. How warm are they and how competent are they? And then the truth is it's warmth, Mm -hmm. right? Going back to what we were talking about earlier, it's easier to come back from a factual screw up and much harder to come back from a warmth screw up, right? If you introduce yourself to the group and you're a little chilly and not in the mood for it today and not yes and in your group and you're knowing them, that's so much harder to come back than if you screwed up a fact, Yeah. right? So warmth. And that's, again, back to yes and, that's all that is. Is that something that can be taught or is it something to be aware of that you can't just go in in a bad mood and then change halfway through? Is that something that takes practice or how, how do you both. teach that? I think both. I mean, it's certainly a mental state. One of the things I practice, here's a great little tip. One of the things that I will practice before a tour is what my touries are doing right now. So an hour before, two hours before, I'll think about them, what they're doing, how excited they are, they're on vacation, they're nervous about meeting me, maybe a little, right? Just a little nervous. They don't know what they're doing today. They don't know me. Are they going to have a good time? And I put myself in their space. And by the time I go to meet them, then I'm excited. I know they're excited. Your tour guide character is something that you can find and then put on whenever you need to. Tour guide Margaret is not the same as the Margaret that's sitting here talking to you, right? Right. And um, just like in theater, just like an actor, if you can walk in and put on your tour guide character then great. You know, that's a great fake it till you make it. That one I would agree with, right? If you're not in the mood today, tough. Put on your tour guide character and greet those people with some warmth because that's all they really care about. And if you want the absolute truth, Shane, your tour could be the worst. You could be the worst tour guide and everything goes wrong and you lose someone. Ah. And if you are warm and kind and enthusiastic through that tour, you will not get a bad review because they can't. If you stay warm and friendly and kind, that really is essentially the most important thing. I really believe that. I really believe that. And then that there are some tips and tricks and some yes ands that keep you in that gracious, positive space. Use them. Use them. Use the tricks. 
Do you have any, uh, just thinking of improv, and I've never done improv, but are there any kind of warm-up things that you teach on before people go on a tour to get into that mindset, get into that character? Uh, definitely. There's a game that is a really great sort of um, connecting to the group game. And I don't play this on a tour, but we definitely do it in the workshop. You stand around in a circle and you have to count to 10, but there's no order, right? So say you have five people standing in a circle, you have to count to 10, but there's no order. So you go and then I go and the next person goes one, two, three. And it's a real game of give and take and getting everybody into that same space and on the same level. I think in a lot of ways, there is a quiet little meditation space that most of us go into before we go out there, just like any performer does. You have to pull it together before yeah. you go. And my way to do that is to think about them. And how about, and uh, this is just me thinking top of my head, the way I prepare for things, do you ever advocate the use of music? So listening to a song before you go out and do a tour guide, do you use that at all? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, always, you know, a morning before a tour, the time before a tour is yeah. good times and getting myself into that right place. But also I find the second the first person shows up, whatever it was I was mad about or angry about, it's completely gone. Yeah. And that's what I love about it. And then you kind of land back when you're finished. <laughs> when you're done with your tour, you're like, oh, yeah, here I am. Oh, everybody's back. And I always know I love my job if I feel better after the tour than I did yeah. before. Right. If you're happier and more excited. And that happens pretty much every time. So that's definitely something I've internalized now and don't even really have to think about it much. But I accept my tour character and do put it on. And I have a hat and I have tour clothes that I wear that I don't wear in my regular everyday life. Right. Like I put this lady on for sure. Well, I'm excited to see her. Oh, she's real well, fun. Cool. You're a lover. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a Sunday morning, so you know it's. Uh, <laughs> It'll be really. I can. I can get it. I can get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. That'll be exciting to see. Yeah, no. And is there a third tip you have? A third tactic? Yes. This is a thought that that I had the other day. If your stories are not making you cry, then why are you telling them? Right. Like I think, like you said, we're all so enthusiastic. We are enthusiastic about what we do. But a lot of times we will just tell a story or a fact because we think it's something that they should know. But maybe it doesn't connect emotionally or maybe it doesn't connect emotionally to the rest of your tour. There are many times when I am out on a tour and I'm telling one of my stories and I get emotional about it. It happens all the time. And certainly I control it and, and all of that stuff. But if it's not making you feel something, yeah, then think about losing it, right? It's just a really quick way to be like, okay, here's my story I'm telling. Why am I telling this story? And um, sometimes just because you love it is enough, right? And that's, that's why we pick any of our stories and our facts. It's what we like. It's in our brain and what we feel we need to share. So if your stories and your facts are not emotional to you, then I would reconsider telling that story or that fact. And do you also then read the group? So for instance, you know, a particular story resonates, another story doesn't, you know, do you advocate that the tour guide should really be reading the group or? All the, all the time. Yeah. That is your job. That yeah. is your job, right? The facts and the stories and all this, that, it's not even your job. Reading yeah. the group is your job. My only thing about this is Take that all with a grain of salt. And one of the huge things we learn in the workshop is our own body language and the body language of our group. But also a lot of times what they look like isn't necessarily what's going on in their head. And that same lady who was stoic through the whole thing and then at the end she loves it. But yes, and I have been known to tell stories that make me cry and maybe they don't make my group cry. And maybe I will still keep telling those stories because I love them. I definitely think I should probably lose some of those stories, right? right. But that is the case of where the audience is helping you decide what is and is not on your tour. They are part of your content. They are completely 
50% of what you're doing up there is their reaction, what they like, what they tune into, what they don't what they write to you about afterwards, what they learned about something. So 100%, I will take what the group is interested in and either use it to change my story or make it more emotional or less or absolutely 100%. You know, I could go up, stand up there and do this alone by myself. Uh, and that's not going to be any fun at all. And I'm going to spring this one on you now. I know I haven't given you time to prep for it, but can you share with us an experience you had when you were on a tour? So you've paid to go on a tour of a tour guide that you thought was absolutely outstanding and what oh. their attributes were. Oh my gosh, so many. Oh, so many, so many. This is what I love and what I've been really trying to work with. There are all different kinds of tour guides and there are all different kinds of personalities. I have one really great tour guide friend. She's so good. And she is very intellectual and she's very um, buttoned up and she's still and quiet and her laugh is amazing. And she's the opposite of me. She's the opposite of me. And she's so good at what she does. So what have I seen from great tour guides? The gamut, the entire gamut I have seen crazy loud tour guides making everything insane. And I've been on quiet, lovely tours where I've learned so much. So most of what I learned, I've learned from watching other tour guides. I cannot tell you how wonderful it is to see how someone else explains something. Oh, oh, I've never thought about it that way. Oh, I think it's so neat. Some of us are engineers. Some of us are storytellers. Some of us are just passionate about the work. So with other guides, what I've seen that I love from them is everything, everything. I mean, humor, but always, always shade the one thing that is the same as warmth and kindness. Yeah, absolutely. And can you think of a, a tour that you went on where the guide was not very good and why they weren't very good? <laughs> Definitely. Uh, when I went, we were in India. Oh, goodness. And our guide at the time. Just one of those, like, it's almost like sometimes in the workshop, we'll play the worst tour guide ever, you know, yeah, the worst yeah. tour guide ever, which is just such a fun, freeing game. And um, he was a real classic, like, this was the home of Al Shana, and Al Shana was born in 1776. So that real classic, just spitting out fast with no emotion. Yeah. And, you know, in that case, he was perfectly warm. He was perfectly kind. And um, that's probably why we didn't leave a bad review. But it's him not having his stories make him cry. Yeah. For, like, wrote. why are you telling me this story? You're not interested. And it might be a really interesting story. So are your stories making you cry? And then are you letting yourself cry? Like, I would have loved to see some emotion on his face and his voice, why it's important, what he's telling me, how it connects to the next thing. Um, I think tipping points, you know, are really interesting. Why this thing led to this thing, led to that thing, led to that thing. Improv certainly shows you how to make connections between yeah. different pieces of information. So definitely for me, it's it's about the emotion and the passion behind the words and the why. Why are you telling me this story? Yeah. And just as we were talking, a, a thought came across my mind about, particularly talking about the, the Indian tour guide there is, you know, I'm reading more and more about self-guided apps where, you know, you download it on your phone and you, you take mm. yourself on the tour. And I've done a few of those in London. I have to say they, they were very good because they had actors and actresses doing the narration. Yeah. Do you think that's going to be a serious threat to the industry? Wow. We're going to see more and more of that? Or do you think, you, you know, robots are not going to take our job, Shane? I've always, you know, I certainly always wondered about this and the self-guided tours. And I've done some of those instead of going on a, on a live tour. No, I'm totally not worried about it. I'm completely not worried about it. And I think things like um, the new experiences, right? Airbnb and all these people getting into it will definitely help. Those are great. They're fine. I don't um, dislike them. If you're going to go on a tour, any tour is good. Anything you can learn is good. But people come on tours to get the different guide, right? To get yeah. the different personality and the different information. Here in Chicago, there are so many tours. Lots of people go on the same tour, but with different guides. Oh, really? Okay. Sure. We're famous for the boat river tours. Yes. And I know lots of people that go on many of the boat tours just to get different guides. 
it's a completely different tour depending on the guide you get. Well, I can tell you that when I come to Chicago, I'm, I'm doing uh, Jeff's donut tours. And I might do that twice, but not because of the guide, but because of the donuts. <laughs> that sounds good, right? That sounds really fair. I think you should. I no, mean, no I'm teasing. No, I'm sure his guides are great. <laughs> hey, excuse to eat more funny. donuts. Exactly, right? exactly right. Marvelous. So, Margaret, where can people find out more about you if they want to hire you, if they want to read up on you? Where do you ask people to go? I am the Tour Boost. So, uh, thetourboost.com. The the in there, the tour boost. I have a Twitter account, tour booster, and a Facebook page, and uh, all the information is there. Really easy to find me. Excellent. I will add those on the show notes for today because uh, I know people listening to the show sometimes working out or on a flight or it may be, and you can find the show notes for today's episode at tourpreneur.com forward slash 12. Margaret, thanks very much for giving up some of your time to, to share more about the Tour Boost. I, I love learning about all the training that's out there for all the tourpreneurs. Thank you, Shane. It was really nice to talk to you. Did you know every weekday Shane curates the most interesting news articles in tours and activities and sends them out in a snappy daily digest? Grab your copy of the Tourpreneur Daily Briefing at www.tourpreneur.com. So a big thank you to Margaret for coming on to the show and sharing her knowledge and wisdom with us. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, Come share your opinions with us. If you go to tourpreneur.com forward slash Facebook, uh, that will send you to our new Facebook group. And I've set that up because I recently sent out a survey with my daily brief that I hope you all enjoy. And quite a few of you said, hey, we'd love someone to come and talk about the topics that your guests raise. And, uh, you know, could you set up a Facebook group? So I've done it. I've got that group set up. So you can find that at tourpreneur.com forward slash Facebook. I'd love to see your posts on there, particularly what you think about Margaret's views on trainings. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you have additional tips you want to give that have helped you in your business? Or is there something you've seen a tour guy do where you've gone, wow, I definitely want to emulate that in my business because I, I really enjoyed uh, that technique or tactic. So again, that's tourpreneur.com forward slash Facebook. Again, appreciate you all tuning in. Please help me out. Please pass the pod. Recommend Tourpreneur to friends, colleagues, peers, anyone who you think will get some value from the Tourpreneur podcast. Until next time. Cheerio. Thanks for listening to the Torpreneur podcast. Be sure to visit torpreneur.com to join the conversation and access the show notes, including links to the resources mentioned on today's episode. This is Torpreneur.